Good morning. Thank you for being here. Here's today. Technically, here's yesterday, because they get a little twitchy if I don't turn in my slides a day in advance. But go with me. Here's today, courtesy of Luke Twyman, who created this visualization. And here's this month. Here's this year. Here's this century. And maybe you're starting to feel a little small at this point. Here's this millennium. Here's this epoch. I don't know about you, now I feel really tiny. Or this period. This era. Here's this eon. Here's this entire earth. Now, compared to the length of the earth, here's life. It's not so bad. It's been life around for a while. Here are humans. Now I feel really small. But what's amazing is that the entire length that we've been here, we've been doing one thing. Uh, I'm here to talk to you this morning about storytelling, and some of you have heard about data as storytelling, but you've heard about that from people who work with data. And I'd like to bring to you this morning a little bit about storytelling in the words of people who do that for a living. So starting with Philip Pullman, who says, after nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the thing we need most in the world. And that's why we've been doing it as long as we've been here. I've often said about data that part of the thing that makes it so important is that it helps us make better decisions when it gets to the right place at the right time. And stories also help us make better decisions, whether it's about where to find food or how to avoid predators. And we still use stories to teach our children how to make good decisions. Uh, we've sanitized our fairy tales a little bit. I don't know if any of you have read the original Brothers Grimm fairy tales. A lot of them are very dark and bloody and meant to frighten children into good behavior and better decision making. But uh, we still have such cautionary tales around in many forms. Ursula K. Le Guin has said, there have been great societies that did not use the wheel, but there have been no societies that did not tell stories. And that's true even today with all the data that we have. And the thing about stories is we use them to place ourselves in context. We use them to give us an idea of history so that we can predict the future, which is exactly what we're doing with data. And stories talk to us not only about ourselves as individuals, but about ourselves as groups and societies. And so you can see we're doing a lot of that similar type of examination with our data. And we're using our social media networks and our technology to continue to share stories about ourselves as individuals and to use them to find context about ourselves as a culture. You didn't know you were going to get so much astronomy this morning. Mark and I didn't necessarily compare notes beforehand, but I'm going to give you a little bit more. We've been using storytelling for a long time uh, in conjunction with technology. And one example of this is Claudius Ptolemy, who was a Roman citizen of Egypt in the second century. And it was his mathematical model of the universe uh, that stood for about a millennium and a half. His was the strongest story for a very long time. And that story was a geocentric model in which all of the bodies of the solar system revolved around the Earth, including the sun. Now, in order for the observable data to comply with this story, he had to posit things like, you know, um, epicycles, and some of the planetary bodies had even third or fourth order epicycles, according to him, to kind of make the data square with the story that everything was revolving around the Earth and that everything moved in a perfect circle. And it wasn't until about 1543 uh, that Copernicus came along and changed the story. He said, I don't think that the Earth is at the center. I think the Sun is at the center. Now, Copernicus himself didn't actually get to improve the mathematical model all that much because he also couldn't let go of this idea of uniform circular motion. And so it wasn't until a little bit later that other people came along and described the elliptical, the elliptical orbits that we know about today. But none of that mathematical improvement would have been possible until the story changed, which Copernicus was responsible for with others. Here's another story that preceded the data and led to a significant discovery. This is Wolfgang Pauli, who in 1930 posited the existence of the particle we now know as the neutrino. 
He described how Beta Decay uh, was responsible for conserving uh, many things and, and argued that in order for this conservation to occur, there had to be this tiny, tiny, tiny little particle with the properties uh, that we now know the neutrino, uh, in fact, has. And it wasn't until about 20 years later that we were capable of actually observing these tiny particles, and, and now we have several large observatories that are able to look at them. But he came up with this story two decades before the data was in place, and it was that story that made the, the technological mathematical advance possible. So sometimes the story comes first, but actually sometimes the data comes first. You're all probably familiar with uh, John Snow and his work here in England about uh, the cholera outbreaks that were happening. He decided uh, to plot on a map the cases of cholera he was seeing, and by looking at the data that way was able to uh, kind of pinpoint the source of the outbreak, which was this pump on Broad Street. And they were able to save lives and prevent the spread of cholera by just removing the handle from the pump so that nobody else could access or drink the contaminated water. So sometimes the data is first, and then the story emerges out of that. But Jon Snow brings me to this idea of putting things on a map and making them visual. Frank Darabont has said that visual storytelling of one kind or another has been around since the cavemen were drawing on the walls. Um, although today we know we have visual storytelling uh, in the form of film. And this brings me to the idea that there are multiple ways to tell a story. You can read it, you can watch it. And the two forms have different you know, pros and cons. There are trade-offs, and one might prefer one form or another. Just like with data, you might prefer one form or another. This is Aaron Koblen's map of uh, US flight data. And depending on who you are and what your interests are, maybe you prefer to look at it visually, maybe you prefer to see the numbers. But there are multiple ways to present data, multiple sides of the story. Jan Martella has said, the world isn't just the way it is. It is how we understand it, no. And in understanding something, we bring something to it. No. Doesn't that make life a story? The idea here being, it's not just about facts in a vacuum. It's about the things that we bring, the interpretations that we bring. And that's true of data, too. People can have multiple interpretations. Sometimes the story gets twisted. This is a sensitive topic here, I know. I don't know how many of you have seen this film. They actually changed the outcomes of some of the battles. Uh, so it's historically quite inaccurate, but it's, it's a very compelling uh, and emotional story. And that can happen with data, too. If I ask you which is larger, the green or the purple? This slide is from a keynote that Steve Jobs gave in 2008. Sometimes we change the outcome of the battles. Or maybe there's not any purposeful uh, change or, or you know, misleading, or as we would call it, marketing. Um, maybe people just have different interpretations of the same facts. So there can be stories that are polarizing. There can be data that's polarizing. Uh, this is an example. Um, of two separate visualizations of the same data set about the changes to the US healthcare system, uh, known as the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. These charts were both made a couple of years ago when the legislation was first passed, although we know it's, it's recently been in the news again. So the visualization on the left there was made by the Joint Economic uh, Minority Committee, otherwise uh, known as the Republicans. Uh, <laughs> And the chart on the right was made by an independent data visualization designer named Robert Palmer in California. Uh, again, the same data set. And we know from both of these that the system is complicated, uh, but we can see that there are sort of different opinions, there are different interpretations. Uh, one might be tempted to use the word propaganda for one of these, but um, data can, can be interpreted in different ways and presented in different ways, just like stories. Rebecca Solnit has said, the stars we are given, the constellations we make. So that's the same idea. That is to say, stars exist in the cosmos, but constellations are the imaginary lines that we draw between them, the readings we give the sky, the stories that we tell. So a colleague of mine in the data sensing lab, Kip Bradford, has said, the difference between physics and engineering is where you build the bridge. In other words, you can build a bridge in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and it can stand up, and good for you. 
That's physics. But if you build a bridge between London and Southwark, now you've changed something. Now you've made an impact. That's engineering. And I would make a parallel argument about data science. I would say, you can do statistics. Good for you. But until you actually make a difference, until you make a connection, until you draw a line, until you tell a story, you're not doing data science. We have a lot of instances right now of people collecting data and analyzing it because they can. It's nice to do things because you can. It's better to do things because you need to, because they're important. And by the way, it's not just the government doing things because they can. But think about something like uh, Jeffrey Brenner, who uh, is a doctor in New Jersey who's been looking at a, um, a practice called hot spotting, which is where you identify the patients who are at highest risk of hospital readmission, and you figure out how to intervene with them, how to help them, so that they don't uh, end up going back into the system over and over and over and over. And he's been able to reduce both hospital admissions, readmissions, and costs by 40 to 50% just by using data analysis. That's something that actually makes a difference. That's a bridge in the city center. Patrick Rothfuss has said, it's like everyone tells a story about themselves inside their own head, always, all the time. The story makes you what you are, and we build ourselves out of that story. So, as we're thinking about where to build our bridges, I want to challenge you. What is the story that you tell about yourself as someone who does data science? You've all probably seen this meme a couple of years ago. Uh, there were all these different occupations that went around, and what my friends think I do, what my mom thinks I do, what my boss thinks I do, what my customers think I do, what I think I do, and what I really do. <laughs> these are all just constructs. These are all just stories, but they're important stories. They affect how we see ourselves. And so I would challenge you, what is the story that you want to tell about yourself? What is the story that other people tell about you? And how can you move it towards something like this? How can you tell a story that's about yourself using data for good? I am coming to the end of my time, and so I was thinking about uh, how I wanted to conclude this talk. And uh, then I, I remembered Samuel Delaney said, endings to be useful must be inconclusive. So I'm going to stay inconclusive and leave the writing of the ending to you, but I do want to leave you with just one or two more thoughts. Here's today, or yesterday. Remember this? Here's this century. Here's this millennium. Do you see all that open space yet to occur, yet to be written? What will you do with that time? What stories will you write? What bridges will you build? Neil Gaiman says, we owe it to each other to tell stories. We've been doing that forever. Go out from here. Tell a story about yourself. Build a bridge in the city center. And then paint it on the walls. Thank you. <laughs>